Today is Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, and we're back to the book of Genesis. So we've come together tonight as the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 44 in just a few moments. So I want to invite you to meet me there in your own copy of the Bible, but we're very glad that you've joined us tonight. We want to also invite you to join us and be with us this coming Lord's Day in person at our church building, 302 Acewood Boulevard, 930 a.m. for Bible study. We're working our way through the last half of the book of Isaiah. And then come together as well at 1030 for the worship assembly. And as we always say, if you have any comments or questions about tonight's class, give me a call or send a text at 608-224-0274. And we would love to hear from you. You could also send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that as well. Uh, it is a warm and windy day here in south central Wisconsin. I can hear the wind chime very angry in the distance there in the backyards. I hope that's not too distracting to you. If you can hear it now, well, now you can, uh, but we'll see how that goes. But uh, today, by the way, marks uh, 23 years working with all of you here at the Four Lakes Congregation. And that first day was also a Wednesday. There are a few of you still around who were here 23 years ago. We were still living in Janesville at the time. But on our first day working with the church here, we drove up here on a Wednesday evening, April 12th, the year 2000, for a Bible class at Mimi Keener's apartment over on Femright Drive. And of course, we were meeting at LVM Elementary School on Sundays at the time, and we normally met in Bill and Jane's living room on Wednesdays back then. But on our first Wednesday together... Uh, you may remember we met at Mimi's place, probably so we had room to eat together that night. I'm assuming that's why we did that. I'm not sure. But a few days later, our family moved into an apartment on the southwest side of Madison as we built a house down here. And then we finished and moved into this house at the end of June 2000, two days before I directed my very first session at Beaver Creek Bible Camp. Uh, so a busy few months back then in the uh, spring and summer of 2000. But as we start our 24th year together tonight, I'm very thankful for your patience uh, through the years. And uh, we're very thankful for the love that you have shown to our family. And I am very thankful that I have apparently not made all of you mad at me at the same time. Uh, I try to spread that out a little bit, so uh, one at a time, please, and uh, let's keep up that tradition going forward. And again, anything that sounds weird in tonight's class, anything you want clarification on, feel free to uh, give a call or send a text or get in touch via email. But it's uh, good to be with all of you, and uh, we certainly love, love you. Uh, tonight, again, we are back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings, written by Moses, who was known as a prophet, by the way. And we're now looking at the life of Joseph. We're uh, cruising through the last few chapters of Genesis. So Joseph is now in charge of famine relief in the land of Egypt. His brothers have already made one trip down to Egypt for food, at which point uh, Joseph basically holds Simeon hostage until they could bring back his youngest brother. And also that would be his dad's favorite son, Benjamin. In last week's class, they finally bring Benjamin back in spite of Joseph, uh, or in spite of Jacob's protest test and Joseph has them eat together where he arranges the seating at the table in order of oldest to youngest and that's just unheard of for a family that large to get that right without knowing uh, would have been very unusual so it would have been a strange situation and of course at that dinner he also gives Benjamin five times as much food as everybody else and at this point they still have no idea that Joseph is Joseph they've been communicating through an interpreter they finished dinner and now, now, now they are getting ready to head back home to their father, Jacob. So this brings us tonight to Joseph in Genesis 44, verses 1 through 5. So let's look at the first paragraph tonight, Genesis 44, verses 1 through 5. Then he commanded his house steward, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Put my cup the silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph had told him. As soon as it was light, the men were sent away, they with their donkeys. They had just gone out of the city and were not far off when Joseph said to his house steward, Up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and which he indeed uses for divination? You have done wrong in doing this. 
Well, this is very close to what Joseph did the last time, isn't it? By having his brother's money put back in their sacks, making it look as if they had stolen. So he does this again, only this time he goes the extra mile, doesn't he? He really goes above and beyond. He tells his servants to put his personal silver cup in Benjamin's sack, along with the money for the grain as he does for the other brothers. Well, um... You know, they they head out early the next morning with their donkeys, and this time, instead of waiting for them to stop for the night and have them find this on their own, Joseph has them chased down. So this is a complete setup, and Joseph tells the servant to confront them about this stolen cup. So he is to ask them, why have you repaid evil for good? So here Joseph is keeping them alive through this famine and just doing everything possible to keep this family alive, and they have stolen the silver cup. At least that's the way uh, he wants them to uh, see this. And so the steward then is to accuse them of stealing Joseph's uh, special cup. This cup is silver, so right there we know that it is valuable. Uh, It is not only valuable monetarily, it is also important. This is a cup that uh, Joseph uses for divination, And we don't have much background on that word. It's the idea of observing various signs to maybe supposedly see the future, maybe kind of to uh, summon an answer from the gods, the magic eight ball, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I've gone to some meetings of the Madison Biblical Archaeological Society where they found some of these uh, plates for divination where they'll have water in the plate and depending on how the water flows in the plate this is what the gods want or this is the way the stars are aligning something along those lines so i don't know if joseph is really doing this or if this is what he says that this cup is for we're not sure but we know it's expensive it's valuable based on the fact that it's silver this is special to joseph it's powerful And then also notice that this silver cup is very distinctive. In other words, uh, everybody knows by looking at it that it is Joseph's. This is not something that they might have found at a thrift shop somewhere on their way out of Egypt. So this is definitely Joseph's cup. This is definitely his. Uh, Down in Janesville, by the way, uh, we used real silverware at our church potluck dinners when we got together for fellowship dinners. Of course, here, I think lately we've been using uh, plastic ware, just easier to wash and keep track of. But down there, we used real silverware. Um, it kind of had this uh, an eclectic assortment, a bunch of random sets of silverware. Who knows where they came from? They were all mixed in together, just random forks, knives, and spoons. And in that pile of forks, Uh, There was a silver fork that was just a tiny bit bigger than the other. So, I mean, it was a a real fork. It was a, I would say, a very manly fork. It was was hefty. It was well-balanced. If you know what I mean, you can get a good fork that just feels good in your hands. There are other forks that are cheap, and you go out to eat, and they kind of... They're not comfortable to eat a big meal with. Well, down there at the Janesville Church of Christ, they had this awesome silver fork that was mixed in there with the others. And uh, I made a point after I found it the first time by accident. After that, I kind of made a point of trying to find that fork and using it almost as a joke. I got the silver fork. And uh, just a few years ago, I kind of remembered that for some reason, thought back to that. And I actually got a few silver forks of my own at one of our thrift stores here in Madison. Uh, If you go thrifting at all, you know a lot of thrift stores kind of have a bin of silverware somewhere, about 25 cents, 99 cents, whatever it is, something like that. So I I bought a few of those uh, and brought them home for old time's sake to remember some good potlucks. And so now at home, I can relive the glorious potluck dinners of my past with a silver fork of my own. And I should tell you, my wife is not a fan of the silver fork. Uh, she, she cuts on me for my choice of a rusty fork, the way she looks at it. I understand she doesn't want uh, silver tarnish in her food. And so I continue on using my silver fork whenever possible. It doesn't match the others, doesn't nest very well with the others, but it's unique. I think, you know, like I am. And I'm just saying that Joseph had his own personal silver mug. It was valuable because it was silver. But it was also special because of what he used it for, and it was also distinctive because as soon as anybody saw it, they would have known that it belonged to Joseph. So if I see you using my fork, you know and I know that it's mine. This is distinctive. And so now the steward has chased down the brothers, and he is accusing these men of having stolen the silver cup. Kind of interesting. He's not concerned about all the money that's back in their sacks, uh, but he's concerned about this uh, silver cup. So this brings us then to Genesis 44, verses 6 through 13, the next paragraph. Genesis 44, verses 6 through 13. 
So he overtook them and spoke these words to them. They said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks we have brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. So he said, Now let it also be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then they hurried, each man lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. He searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and when each man loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. Well, when the steward catches up and makes the accusation, the brothers react very defensively, almost in disbelief. Got the uh, beagle alarm going off for the second time in uh, three years now. Must be getting a package today. But anyway, the steward comes in here, kind of grills them. They open the sacks. And uh, I mean, it's an outrageous accusation to begin with. And, you know, we would have to be complete morons with a death wish to do something like that. And kind of to prove that they would never consider stealing the silver cup, they remind the steward that they brought back the money from last time. So we're not thieves. We are honest people. We, we would never even consider doing such a thing. And, of course, we cringe when they say what they're about to say, but the speaker here, to prove their honesty, suggests that he's welcome to kill whoever it is among them who has the cup. Let him die. And not only that, but if you find the cup with us, we will be your slaves. And just a thought here, is it ever wise to make an offer like that? Is it ever wise to make an offer like that? No. Why, why, why should these brothers have been at least a little bit cautious? You know, if they have thought this through, would they really have said this? You know, remember, none of them took the money back with them the first time, did they? And yet the money was there in their sacks. So you would think if you just took a moment to pause before making this promise, you really wouldn't have said such a thing. So it's almost like Jephthah's vow. A very rash vow, spur of the moment, not really thinking through the, the possible consequences here. And so you might have thought that they might have learned something from that previous experience. You know, just because you didn't steal something doesn't mean it's not in your sack, as they had learned just a few weeks before this. But they make the promise, uh, kill the guy with the cup, the rest of us will be your servants. And so at this point, the steward agrees to this offer with a twist. Uh, not that the cup stealer would die, but that the cup stealer would stay behind as a slaves and the rest of these guys could go free. So a little bit more merciful than these men were suggesting, but still pretty harsh. So this is good. So they all lower their sacks to the ground. The steward searches from oldest to youngest until he finally finds the cup in Benjamin's sack. And I find it very interesting, by the way, that nothing is said of the fact that all of them have their money once again. So just as before, They've also got the cash. Um, but uh, that's not the shocking thing in this story. The most shocking revelation here is that Benjamin is the guy who has the cup. And this is absolutely devastating to these brothers. So they tear their clothes. They head back into the city to deal with this, uh, to learn their fate, kind of to see what's going to happen next. So this brings us then to Genesis 44, verses 14 through 17. Genesis 44, verses 14 through 17. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that such a man as I can indeed practice divination? So Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves." both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it for me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Well, not much time has passed at all because Joseph is still in the house. So it's like they just left and the steward went running after him almost immediately here. So they come in rather quickly. They all fall to the ground before Joseph. I think I've lost count, um, but this has happened a number of times by now, just as Joseph had dreamed many years earlier. Uh, some of my notes were saying, I think this is the fourth time that they've bowed down. I'm not sure about that. I'd have to go back and reread all of those chapters. Maybe if you want to, go for it. But uh, as they're bowed down to the ground once again, 
uh, Joseph grills his brothers yet again and again to practice divination uh, is to observe signs. So Joseph supposedly knows things that other people can't know. He is the human lie detector. You know, I'm thinking if you lead a nation for a number of years, as Joseph has basically done now, if you're in charge of a project this large, you start to get to know when people are telling the truth and when they're lying. And it begins to be more obvious, I would imagine, with experience. I've known some prison wardens and some guys who work in county jails. Those guys can see through stuff like you wouldn't believe. They can just cut to the heart of the issue and really get to what's going on. And that's pretty much what Joseph does here. So at this point, Judah speaks up and he admits, we have no excuse. There's nothing we can say. And Judah recognizes, though, that this seems to be punishment from God. And I find that interesting. You know, God somehow has found out what we've done. And this is God's punishment that has finally caught up to us. And so Judah then throws himself at Joseph's mercy. Uh, We are yours. We have absolutely no excuse. But Joseph, though, declines having all these men as slaves. No, I'll just take the youngest. Just take this guy over here, the guy with the cup. I'll keep Benjamin here. And the rest of you, you can go home to your father. Do we think this is going to be acceptable? Not at all. And yet, I love how Joseph says that they can go in peace to their father. Oh, that's awful, isn't it? He knows exactly what he's doing here. He doesn't just say, well, I'll take the young one and you guys can go. No, he says you can go in peace to your father. So he puts peace and father in the same sentence there. I mean, he knows that this will not be peaceful. This will be, it's terrible mental anguish. He's killing these guys. Uh, But ultimately, I think he's really setting this up as a test. And I think we'll see this uh, play out here. You know, he wants to know whether his brothers have changed. Are these still the same guys I was with 22 or whatever years ago? You know, how will they handle this situation? Uh, What are they going to do with this? So let's continue then tonight with Genesis 44, verses 18 through 29. Genesis 44, 18 through 29. Then Judah approached him and said, Oh, my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears, and do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, We have an old father and a little child of his own age. Now his brother is dead, so he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. But we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, however, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Thus it came about, when we went up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. Our father said, Go back, buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow." Well, after Joseph tells the rest of them to go home and just leave Benjamin behind, Judah speaks up again very respectfully, and he explains how this started. You demanded to know about our father. You demanded to know about our little brother. His brother's dead, and now this young guy, he's the only one left. You wanted to see him, but if he should somehow, somehow not come back, it would absolutely devastate our father. But you insisted that we bring our younger brother or else we couldn't come back. So we told dad and he reiterated, if anything happens to this one, I will die. You will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Well, Sheol, of course, was considered the place of the dead. So you're going to drive me into the grave kind of statement. So Judah is explaining this to Joseph, still not knowing that Joseph is Joseph. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 44 verses 30 through 34. Genesis 44 verses 30 through 34. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, when he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. 
Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me for fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father? Judah then continues explaining to Joseph that when they return to Jacob and if they don't have Benjamin with them, their lives are tied together. If you keep Benjamin here, our father will die. And then he also explains that they put themselves on the line by bringing Benjamin. They put themselves up as collateral. If they don't bring Benjamin back, they will bear the blame for losing him. So Judah then suggests that he personally stay behind instead of his little brother. Little half-brother, we should say. So let Benjamin go home and take me as your slave instead. I just I can't let this happen to our father. And this brings us to the end of Genesis 44. In terms of a, a practical application of Genesis 44, I might suggest just noting the transformation of Judah through the years. I think that's the most really amazing thing to me, at least in this chapter. More than 20 years earlier, if you remember, Judah was the one who suggested selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites. So yeah, it was better than killing Joseph, which is what some of the other brothers apparently wanted to do. But what a callous disregard for your own uh, physical brothers to be willing to sell one of your brothers into slavery. But now though, Judah is the one who has the courage to speak up in front of one of the most powerful rulers on earth at that time and offer his own life in exchange for the life of his youngest brother. So let's just notice here that Judah has definitely changed through the years, hasn't he? And we should also note that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. So I think it's interesting that we have Judah offering his life in exchange for Benjamin's life. And now we have his descendant, Jesus, offering his life for all of ours. It's just an interesting comparison between the two. I think an interesting observation uh, from this chapter. I hate to leave with a cliffhanger like this, not knowing what's happening next, but we're at a very good stopping place. Judah has made his appeal to Joseph, not knowing that Joseph is Joseph. And now we wait to see how Joseph will respond to that offer. Hopefully we can come back together next week and take a look at what happens next in Genesis chapter 45. Uh, thank you again for being with us tonight. We're glad you took the time to be here. And I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 and 10.30, getting back to our studies of Isaiah and through the book of Hebrews. I think we're looking at the first few verses in Hebrews chapter 6. Well, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the one and only, creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Tonight we've seen your patience demonstrated in the life of Judah, as he has transitioned from a man willing to sell his own brother to a man willing to take the place of another, offering to give his life as an exchange. Tonight, Father, we thank you for Jesus, a descendant of Judah, and we're thankful that Jesus offered his life for us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.